Core Pure Paper 1 for further mathematics. This is the March 2022 mock examinations. Okay, question number one. Uh, we're told f of z is this cubic. Okay, we've got an unknown coefficient of z squared and the constant. Uh, and we're told p and q are real. <clears throat> Given that uh, 3 minus 2 root 2i is a root of the equation, show all the roots of f of z equals 0 on an argand diagram. Okay, so first things first is we know that the sum of the roots must equal p on 3. That's yeah, like minus p on 3. So 3 minus 2 root 2i, two that's one root, plus 3 plus 2 root 2i, two which is another root, and we know that because we're told p and q are real, which means this is a cubic with real coefficients, which means any complex roots must appear in complex conjugate pairs, uh, plus our unknown root, which I'll call alpha, that must equal minus p over 3. Um, the sum of the product is going to be 57 on 3. So that is 3 minus 2 root 2i two times 3 plus 2 root 2i two plus 3 minus 2 root 2i two times alpha plus 3 plus 2 root 2i two times alpha. That must equal positive 57 on 3, which is 19. That's actually a linear equation in alpha, which I'll look to solve in a minute. And then finally, the product of the roots. So that's 3 minus 2 root 2i times 3 plus 2 root 2i times alpha. That must equal minus q on 3. So what we've got here is we've got three equations in uh, P, alpha, and Q. So I can use this second equation to find alpha, because that's the only unknown there, and then I can use the top one to find P and the bottom one to find Q. I will then check my answer with the calculators. It does say to show them on an argand diagram, so I need to actually sketch those uh, to get the full mark. Okay, what's this product? Well, we're gonna get nine. The imaginary parts are gonna cancel out because it's a complex number times it's conjugate, so I can ignore that. And then we've got four, 4 times 2 times minus 1 times i squared, so that's positive. So I'll get 9 plus 8 plus 3 alpha plus 3 alpha, so that's 6 alpha. And then again, the imaginary parts will cancel out. And that's going to equal 19. That's 17, so therefore 6 alpha must be 2, therefore alpha must be a third. Okay. Alpha is a third. We can now use this over here to find what P is. So we're going to get P. Uh, again, the imaginary part is going to cancel out. It's supposed to disappear. We're left with 3 plus 3 plus alpha. But alpha is a third. So that's 6 and a third, which is 19 thirds. So 19 thirds. So P must be minus 19. Make that 19 thirds on the right. And we can do the same thing with Q. Uh, we know that product is 17. So 17 alpha equals minus Q on 3. Alpha is a third. So 17 thirds equals minus Q thirds. So therefore Q is minus 17. So we can just check that by using the equation solver on the calculator. So if I go into equation mode, and this is a polynomial of degree 3. Coefficient of, of z cubed is 3. Coefficient of z squared is p, which I've got is minus 19. Coefficient of z is 57. And coefficient of z to the 0 is minus 17. And we get that x is a third. Oh, I am in real mode. So it's going to uh, pop over into complex mode. There we go. That should give me the other two roots as well. There we go. Uh, so we've got positive a third, which is my alpha. And then we've got 3 plus 2 root 2i, which was the conjugate of the root that was given. And then we've got 3 minus 2 root 2i, which is the root that was given. So that confirms then that these are indeed uh, the correct, um, correct values of p, q, and alpha. 
it's a nice to sketch where they are on an argon diagram. So an argon diagram is your number plane. There we have a real axis there an imaginary axis there. Um, so the real root is at the third, so it's about there, something positive. And then the other two roots were at three plus or minus. Root two i, so let's go there and there. So we have three plus two root two i and three minus two root two i and that was a third. And those are the three roots of the cubic on a single argon diagram. Um, part B, uh, find the values of P and Q. Oh, well, we've done that. Um, I'm not entirely sure how they would expect you to find P and Q uh, without finding the root. Oh, I guess, you, I guess you could just use that, couldn't you? Seems a lot of marks, though. But hey-ho. Um, yeah, so you didn't need to find P and Q for part, I, uh, for part A. You just needed that equation. Solve for alpha to get a third and then plot those three points. Um, seems not much work for seven marks, but there we go. Uh, part B, we've already calculated that P was minus 19 and Q was minus 17. There we go. Question number two. Uh, show that this integral, which is an improper integral because of the infinite there, um, is equal to log of K where k is a rational number to be found. Okay, so I'm gonna split this up into partial fractions. So I'm gonna say eight x minus 12 is identical to uh, a linear, a x plus b times x plus one, um, plus constant c times two x squared plus three. So the, the partial fraction that I'm using is 8x minus 12 over 2x squared plus 3 times x plus 1 is identical to some linear function divided by this quadratic, 2x squared plus 3, plus some constant over x plus 1. Okay, so that's the partial fraction setup I'm using. Um, so I'm going to create the coefficients of the powers of x. So I've got x squared. I've got x to the power 1 and I've got x to the power 0. So my x squared on the left, I've got 0. On the right, I've got a. Okay, ax times x is ax squared. And I've also got 2c. Uh, my coefficients of x to the 1. On the left, I've got an 8. On the right, I've got an a plus a b. That's it, just a plus b. And then my x to the 0 on the left, I've got minus 12. And on the right, I've got b plus 3c. So this is a set of linear simultaneous equations, which you could go about solving manually. But I will use equation mode to do this. And this is now a simultaneous equation system with three unknowns. Um, so I've got 1a, no b's, 2c's, that sums to 0. 1a, 1b, no c's, sums to 8. And 0a's, 1b, and 3c's will sum to minus 12. And that gives me that a is 8, b is 0, and c is minus 4. Okay, and you can just state that because the exam will know full well that you can take this calculator into the exam. So that's not a problem. And then we can split up the integral. So I'm going to say the integral then, which I want to call i, is equal to the limit as a tends to infinity. That deals with the improper part of it. Between 0 and a of this partial fraction system. So we're going to get 8x divided by 2x squared plus 3 minus 4 over x plus 1 dx. Okay, so that's, um, that's now what our integral looks like. Um, and in both cases, we can make the top uh, the differential of the bottom, which means we can just log the bottom. So the limit 
as A tends to infinity. Uh, the differential of the bottom here is 4x. I've got 8x, so I'm going to get a 2 times the natural log of the mod of the bottom, but I don't need to mod this one because it's always positive because x is real. And then the, the differential of the bottom is 1, so I need to minus 4 times the natural log. And this time I should mod the bottom, although between 0 and a, um, that's always, again, going to be positive, so I don't actually have to. Um, between 0 and a. There we go. Uh, and now plug in the limits. So we have the limit as a tends to infinity of... 2 times log of 2a squared plus 3 minus 4 times log of a plus 1 minus, when x is 0, so that's going to be 2 log 3. And when x is 0 in there, I'll get 4 log 1, but log 1 is 0, so that disappears. And then combine those logs into 1. It's going to be limit as a tends to infinity of, I'm going to bring these in as powers now. So that's going to be the natural log of 2a squared plus 3 squared. So that 2 is coming in as a power for that one. This one, the minus 4, so it's going to be over a plus 1 to the power of 4. And this one is also going to be 1 over. Uh, it's going to be 1 over 8. that um, limit as a tends to infinity of the natural log of 4a to the 4 plus a cubic term no plus a quadratic term plus a constant I don't overly care about those because they're going to disappear as a goes to infinity they become negligible and on the bottom, we're going to get 8 into a to the 4 plus, again, it's going to be a cubic, a, a quadratic, a constant, and a linear, um, and a constant term. Uh, so they'll disappear. So I don't care about those because it's the leading term that's going to influence um, what this tends towards as a tends to infinity. So now I'll take a to infinity. I've got 4a to the power of 4 divided by 8a to the power of 4. Uh, so that's just a half. So I get the natural log of a half. And that's my answer. We can check that. Ish. So I'm going to go back into one matrix mode. Plug in the original integral. That is 8x minus 12 divided by 2x squared plus 3 multiplied by x plus 1. Okay, that's valid all the way from 0 to infinity. Can't plug infinity in as a limit, so I'm just going to plug in a 1,000. Um, and hopefully that'll be close enough. And log of a half. Ooh, maybe a 1,000 isn't quite big enough. Let's try a bigger number then. Let's try a million. Take a bit longer to process. Oh, have I gone wrong somewhere? Hmm. 8x minus 12 over 2x squared plus 3 times x plus 1. Mm. No issues there. 0 to a million. Mm. These numbers are too different for me to be happy that this is a correct answer. Um, so let me just plug in this integral. Let's see if this comes out to be the same. Uh, so the integral of 8x over 2x squared plus 3 minus 4 over x plus 1 between 0 and a million. Okay, that's the same as the integral above. Okay. Oh, there we go. That's, uh, I did, I did 2 to the power of 3, not 3 to the power of 2. Okay, that's my mistake. So this isn't an eighth at all, this is a ninth, because it's three squared, not two cubed. Uh, so that is my mistake. So that should be nine, 
which means that should be nine, which means it should be log of four ninths, which can't be simplified. Okay, let's see if that comes out as a closer answer than four ninths. Ah, there we go. That's much closer to the, uh, the value of the integral. Um, so I could be happy now that these two are indeed the same. So yes, log of four ninths uh, was the answer to that question. Okay, question number three. Determine the first two non-zero terms in ascending powers of x of the Maclaurin series for f of x, giving each coefficient in its simplest form. Okay, so for the Maclaurin series, we're going to need to differentiate. So f of x equals arc sine of x, which means f of zero is zero. So that doesn't count as one of the terms because it says the first two non-zero terms. So I need to differentiate. Fortunately, the differential of arc sine is given in the formula book. So I nip over to the differentials. There we go. Differential of arc sine is one over the square root of one minus x squared. So f prime of x is equal to one over the square root of one minus x squared. And f primed of zero, therefore, is one. Because I get one over root one. F double primed, so we can differentiate that. Just a quick little chain rule. So the, the power minus a half is going to go to minus three halves. Okay, so I've multiplied by the power, I've subtracted one from the power, I then need to times by the derivative of the contents by the chain rule, so I need to times that by minus two x. So that comes out to be x into one minus x squared to the power of minus three over two. So f double primed of zero, that's going to equal zero because of this x term. And then f triple primed of x is, well, I can differentiate that. I could differentiate using that, uh, using the product rule. Uh, so that's gonna be one minus x squared times minus three over two. So that's that times the differential of that, plus x times something. I don't overly care because when x is zero, that's going to disappear. So f triple primed of zero is also one. Okay, and we can actually check that using the calculator. I'll just clear all this. So we want the single derivative. Let's just plug that one in of one over the square root of one minus x squared at the point when x is zero. That should come out to be zero. Okay, so that's the second derivative because I've differentiated the first derivative. Um, but also this calculator can double differentiate, which is great. So I get one over the square root of one minus x squared at x is zero should give me one, which it does. So that kind of confirms that these two values are indeed correct. Um, so we've now got two um, derivatives that are non-zero. So we can um, formulate our Maclaurin series. And just to refresh your memory, the Maclaurin series is in the formula book. It is under Maclaurin's and Taylor series, and this is the general case. So we're gonna use this. Um, f of zero and f double primed of zero are both zeros, so they disappear. So we've got x times f primed of zero, and then we need to plug in r is three to find the, uh, the third term here. Uh, but what you'll get is that f of x is gonna be approximately one times x plus one times x cubed over three factorial, uh, which is x plus x cubed over six. And that's the answer. Okay, part B. Substitute x as a half into the answer to part A and hence find an approximate, approximate value of pi. Give your answer in the form p over q, where p and q are integers to be determined. Okay, so arc sine of a half, we know that the exact value of that is pi on six, which the calculator can give you if you're unsure. So inverse sine of 0.5 is pi on six. Okay, so we can get that from there. Um, but also arc sine of a half is approximately a half plus an eighth over six, which is me plugging in x as a half into this Maclaurin series. 
um, which comes out to be a half plus one over 48. And this is going to be 24 48, so plus 1 48 is 25 48, um, which can't simplify because there's only fives in the top and no fives in the bottom. Uh, so that's our approximation. Okay. Um, well, that's the approximation for pi on 6. Um, so actually, the question is asked for an approximate value of pi. Therefore, pi is about 150 on 48. Okay, because pi on 6 is that, so we need to times up by 6 to get an approximate value for pi. Uh, and that is 75 over 24. And let's just see how close that is. 3.125. So not too bad. Pi is that. Okay, question number four. Use De Morf's theorem to prove that sine of seven theta equals sine, seven sine theta minus 56 sine cubed of theta plus 112 sine to the five of theta plus uh, minus 64 sine to the seven of theta. Okay, so for this question, I'm gonna say Z is equal to cos of theta plus I times sine of theta. And I'm going to use De Morf's theorem. And actually, I'm just going to use shorthand. So I'm going to say it's C plus IS, where C is cos of theta and S is sine of theta. Um, so I can use De Morf's theorem that says um, Z to the 7 then is going to be cos of 7 theta plus I times sine of 7 theta. Okay, that's using De Morf's theorem. Um, but I can also use the binomial expansion. Uh, Z to the 7 is going to be C plus IS to the power 7, which is C to the 7 plus uh, 7C1, C to the 7S, I, plus 7C2, oh, sorry, it should be to the 6, C to the 5, S squared, I squared, plus 7C3, C to the 4, S 3, I cubed, plus 7, C 4, C to the 3, S to the 4, I to the 4, plus 7, C 5, C to the 2, S to the 5, I to the 5, plus 7, C 6, C, S to the 6, I to the 6, plus 7, C 7. Um, c to the 0, s to the 7, i to the 7. Now, obviously, that could be simplified by quite a lot. Um, and I want to equate the imaginary parts of these because it's all about the sine of 7 theta. I'm just going to look at the imaginary part of this, which equates to the imaginary part, which is here, 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 and here. Okay, so I don't need to worry about those because that's real, that's real, and that's real. Oh, and that's real. So I can call that as well. Okay, so this implies then that sine of 7 theta, which is the imaginary part, is this thing. I ignore the i because I've just taken the imaginary part. So 7c1 is 7. Uh, cos to the power 6 times sine. Plus 7c3. So that is 7... C3 comes out as 35. 35 C to the 4 S cubed I cubed, that's actually minus there, plus 7 C5. Again, you could use the calculator for 21. So that's 21 C squared S to the 5. And then finally, again, this is going to be a negative because I to the 7 is negative I. So that's going to be minus. Uh, S to the 7. Okay. Um, brilliant. Now, uh, cross referencing this with what the answer is, uh, we've got no causes in there, and we've got cos of the 6, cos of the 4, and cos squared, so I'm going to replace all that. So that is 7 into 1 minus S squared cubed, because 1 minus S squared is C squared. Uh, but we want c squared to the, to the 3. 
at minus 35 into 1 minus s squared squared times s cubed. There's an s in there. Uh, plus 21, 1 minus s squared, s to the 5, and then I've got the minus s to the 7 at the end. And then bring the coefficients together. So let's start with the coefficient of sine, which is only going to come from the 7 times the constant here. So that's 7 times sine. Uh, the coefficient of s cubed, there's going to be 1 from here and 1 from here. So I'm going to get... I want a squared from this bracket, so it's going to be minus 2 there, so it's minus 14. And then I'm going to get a minus 35 from here. To give me s cubed. Um, s to the 5, I'm going to get 1 from here, here, and here now. Uh, so I want s to the 4 here. Oh no, that's going to be 21. Um, so that's going to be 3 from there so that's going to be 21 i'm going to get two from here so that's going to be um, minus because i've got a negative and a negative 70. And i'm going to get one from here so that's plus 21 s to the five and then the finally the s to the seven term um, is going to be the s to the six from this bracket which is minus seven um i'm going to get the, the s to the four from this bracket so that's minus 35. And we get the minus from there. So that's minus 21. And then I get minus 1 there. S to the 7. And writing out this is just illustrating to the examiner that you know exactly where these numbers have come from. So that's 7 sine minus 56 sine cubed. Um, oh, that should be a plus. 112 sine to the 5, minus 42, 63, 64, sine to the 7. And just conclude, therefore, sine of 7 theta is identical to 7 sine of theta, minus 56 sine cubed of theta, plus 112 sine to the 5 of theta, minus 64 sine to the 7 of theta. Okay. Hence, find the distinct roots of this equation. So this is a septic equation, polynomial of order seven, uh, giving an answer to three decimal places where appropriate. Okay, so there must be some link from here to here because it's partly because it's part of the same question, but also it's used the word hence. Um, so actually, we have to use this part to solve this. So what I'm noticing here is I've got a seven times something minus 56 times something cubed plus 112 times, you know, we, we can make the links that x must be sine of theta. So for part b, I'm going to say x equals sine of theta. So we know then that sine of 7 theta is equal to 7 sine of theta minus 56 sine cubed um, plus 112 sine to the 5 minus 64. So if I add 1 to that, which is what this question is about, 7x minus 56 cubed plus 112x to the 5 minus 64x to the 7 plus 1, I'm actually just solving the equation sine of 7 theta plus 1 equals 0. Could put a plus one on both sides. Okay, I'm solving this equation is equal to zero. So sine of seven theta plus one equals zero. That means sine of seven theta equals minus one. Um, which is going to give me a, a number of values. So if you think of the curve of sine of seven theta. Um, it's going to equal minus 1 down here at these points. Okay. So usually that would be um, well, pi on 2, pi, 3 pi on 2, but it's divided by 7. So 
7 theta equals 3 pi on 2. Uh, add 2 pi, so 5 pi on 2. Oh, 7 pi on 2. 11 pi on 2. 15 pi on 2. 19 pi on 2. 23 pi on 2. 5, 6, and 27 pi on 2. And then divide by 7. So theta equals 3 pi on 14, 7 pi on 14, 11 pi on 14, 15 pi on 14, 19 pi on 14, 23 pi on 14, and 27 pi on 14. Okay, so those are the values of theta. So now to get x, I just plug those theta values in. So I get x is equal to, and I stopped at 7 because then it's just going to start repeating when I plug in the next one. So the next one would have been 31 pi on 14, but that's the same as 3 pi on 14 when I sign it, um, because that's a difference of 2 pi. Okay, so I'm stopping at 7. And also, with a order 7 polynomial, you'd expect seven, up to 7 solutions, so it's not going to be more than that. Okay, so I'm going to use table mode for this, because I don't want to plug them all in at once. Uh, so I'm in radio mode, so it's fine. Oops. Just delete everything that's in there currently. Okay, so my function is uh, sine of x. And I want to set my values to be 3 pi on 14 all the way up to 27 pi on 14. And I want to go in steps of um, 2 pi on 7. Okay. okay. And the question says three decimal places where appropriate. So the first one gives me 0 0.623. The next one is 1, which is obviously that's pi on 2. Uh, next one is 0 0.623 again. Then I'm going to get minus 0 0.223. Get minus 0 0.901. Minus 0 0.901. Uh, minus 0 0.223. And that's the end. So distinct roots. Ignore the duplicates. So we've got x is minus 0 0.901, minus 0 0.223, um, 0 0.623, 0 0.623, and 1. These are my answers. And I can check that, actually, if I go to plot this function. Uh, so I go into graph mode and delete that. Yes. Plug in the function, which was 1 plus 7x minus 56x cubed plus 112x to the power of 5 minus 64x to the power of 7. Need to change the V window there. Um, let's go, well, all the values will be minus 1 and 1, so let's take x from minus 1 to 1. And yeah, y from minus 10 to 10, why not? Okay, and let's try and solve these. So I want the roots. Uh, minus 0.2225, so that's the minus 0.223. It's taking a bit of time to load. Uh, minus 0 0.9009, so that's the minus 0 0.901. Um, why has it done that? Where did it draw? Right, let's have a look at the V window. Ah, there we go. I want to go minus one to one. There we go. That's better. 
and to solve the roots. Okay, so that's the minus 0 0.901, that's the minus 0 0.223. Uh, this one should be the 0 0.623, which it is. And then finally, a single root over there at one. Boom, there we go. Confirm your answer. Okay, question five. Y equals arctan of x. Assuming the derivative of tan, prove that dy by dx is that thing. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tan both sides and then differentiate implicitly. So tan of y will equal to x. Differentiate implicitly, we can assume the differential of tan is sec squared. I'm told we can do that. Times dy by dx. Uh, that's going to equal 1. That's a differential of the right-hand side. Uh, therefore, dy by dx is equal to 1 over sec squared of y. But sec squared of y is 1 plus tan squared of y. That's using a trig identity from year 13 maths. But tan of y is x, by definition up here. Therefore, that is 1 over 1 plus x squared, uh, as required. Okay, f of x equals x arctan of 4x. Part B, show that this integral is this thing, where k is an arbitrary constant, so that'll be from the integration, and then a, b, c are constants to be determined. Okay, so we're going to use integration by parts for this thing, uh, x times arctan. The fact that we've been asked to differentiate arctan indicates that maybe we should use u to be arctan of 4x because uh, then we can use the result that's given, and we don't know how to integrate this without using parts. So um, it doesn't follow the late rule. U primed, well, that's this, but that is was when the contents was x. Uh, this is now a 4x, so we need to multiply it by derivative of the, of the contents, which is um, 4, and also the x then gets replaced in the 4x. So it's going to be 1 over 1 plus 4. 4x squared times 4. So that equals 4 divided by 1 plus 16x squared. Okay, so you need to do a little chain rule um, in there. Or you can, uh, yes. Uh, v primed is x. And v then is the integral of that, which is a half x squared. Okay, now we've got those definitions for integration by parts. We can just plug it into the formula, which is in the formula book. So the integral is going to be v, v u primed. So we're going to get 2x squared over 1 plus 16x squared minus the integral of... No, no, it's uv. Oh, wakey, wakey. UV is that times that, so that's a half x squared times arctan of 4x minus the integral of VU primed, which is 2x squared over 1 plus 16x squared dx. Okay, uh, I'm going to use partial fractions to get rid of that because we should be able to write that as a linear over quadratic plus a constant. You, you could do some algebra on the fraction to do this, but I usually use partial fractions for these. 1 plus 16x squared, that is going to be something like ax plus b over 1 plus 16x squared plus some constant. So we're going to get 2x squared is identical to um, Hmm. I'm going to go with it. Ax plus b, oh yeah, Ax plus b, uh, yeah, that's it, plus c into 1 plus 16x squared. There we go. Um, equating the coefficients of x squared, I get 2 is identical to 16c. That tells me that c is an eighth. Equating the coefficients of x, I get 0 is identical to a. That tells me that a is zero. 
and equating the coefficients of x to the zero, I get zero is identical to b plus c, which tells me that b is minus an eighth. So therefore this integral now will become the half x squared times arctan of four x minus the integral of this partial fraction. So it's the integral of an eighth minus an eighth times one over one plus 16 x squared dx. Okay, so that's a half x squared times arctan of four x minus x on eight. Okay, so that's what that integrates to. This one's gonna be some kind of arctan as well because of the, the 16 x squared on the bottom. And just a one on top. Um, so I'm going to let u equal 4x there, which means du by dx is 4. So dx is du on 4. So that's plus, because I've got that and that. At the eighth, I'm going to pull out as a factor. The dx gets replaced with du on 4. So that's times a quarter times the integral of 1 over 1 plus u squared du. So I get a half x squared times arctan of 4x minus x on 8 plus 1 over 32 arctan of u, but u is 4x. And now that my integral has disappeared, I get a plus k. Does that match the form that it wants? ax squared arctan of 4x, so I have um, my a is a half, plus bx, so my b is negative an eighth, plus c arctan of 4x, so my c is, uh, is 1 over 32, uh, plus my arbitrary constant k, um, which matches. Okay, so I'm going to uh, leave that there. I could check the answer by plugging in some limits, but um, I, I will just leave it there. And then finally, part C, hence find an exact form, the mean value of f of x over the integral naught to root three on four. Okay, so the mean value theorem. Um, so I'm gonna integrate from naught to root three on four, this function, which is x arctan of four x dx, multiplied by the length of that. Um, sorry, multiply the reciprocal of the length, uh, which is going to be root 3 on 4 minus 0. Okay. So I need to work out this integral. Um, so that's going to be plugging in root 3 on 4 into here. Root 3 on 4 squared is going to be 3 sixteenths times a half is 3 30 seconds times arctan of root three, which is pi on three, minus root three on four divided by eight, which is root three on 32, plus one over 32 times arctan of root three, which again is pi on three. Uh, the k I don't need to worry about, minus the lower limit, so I get minus zero plus zero, minus zero, because all three of those terms are zero when x is zero, so that's good. And then need to times that by four root three over three, which is what uh, this is. Okay. So it does want the exact value. Um, so that's gonna be pi on 32, plus pi on 96, so that's four pi on 96. Four pi on 96, let's just check that. So we need to make small mistakes like that. We don't, we don't wanna do that in an exam setting. So three over 32 times a third, plus one over 32 times a third is one over 24. Yep. And then the constant term is that thing.
times 4 root 3 on 3. So 4 times 4 root 3 all divided by 96 times 3 is root 3 pi of 18. And then I've also got the square root of 3 divided by 32 times 4 root 3 over 3 minus an eighth. Okay. Now, I think I will check that answer. So it's the integral of x times the inverse tan of 4x between 0 and the square root of 3 quarters. And then plug in this number, I get root 3 pi divided by 18 minus an eighth. And also I did notice I didn't actually, oops. Uh, divide that by the value of the range, which was root three on four minus zero. There we go, they're the same number. So that not only confirms that part C is correct, but also that part B is correct. So it's very reassuring uh, to, to move on, um, which is good. That is good news. Okay, question number, five, uh, question number six even. All right, two proof by induction questions. Um, so the first one is a sigma and the second one is a, a divisibility. Both of them six marks. Okay, so step one for any proof by induction question, n equals one. So the left hand side, uh, we are summing from r equals one to one of three r plus one times r plus two. Plug in one into that. Uh, we're going to get 4 times 3, which is 12. And the right-hand side, uh, we're going to get 1 times 3 times 4, uh, which equals 12. And these two are the same. Therefore, true for n equals 1. Okay, that's the first step of the proof. Step 2. Um, broken down into three sub-steps. The first sub-step is to state your assumption. You always must state your assumption. I'm assuming that the sum from r equals 1 to k of 3r plus 1 times r plus 2 is identical to k into k plus 2 times k plus 3. I'm assuming that's true for some positive integer k. I'll show that the sum from r equals 1 to k plus 1 of 3r plus 1 times r plus 2 is identical to k plus 1 times k plus 3 times k plus 4. Uh, so that's replacing k with k plus 1 from the assumption. Uh, this is then my target. Okay, something I'll refer to later. Uh, and then Substep three, but the sum from r equals one to k plus one is identical to the sum from r equals one to k plus the k plus oneth term. So now we can use our assumption. So that's k into k plus two times k plus three plus the k plus 1th term. The k plus 1th term is k plus 1 in here for r. So that's going to be um, 3k plus 4 times k plus 3. And now I need to algebraically show that that is equivalent to this. So I can see that there's a k plus 3 common to both um, of these two terms, which is good because there's a k plus 3 in my answer. So I'm going to say this is k plus 3 into k into k plus 2 plus 3k plus 
that is equal to k plus 3 into k squared plus 2k, oops, sorry, plus 5k, plus 4, which is equal to k plus 3 times k plus 4 times k plus 1. Okay, it's quite twice in that quadratic. Um, and that's equal to k plus 1 times k plus 3 times k plus 4. All right, the commutativity of multiplication, uh, it's the same as target. Okay. And then step three. Don't forget to conclude. I have shown it's true for n equals one by assuming it's true for n equals k. I've shown oops, half of that. There we go. Shown it's true for n equals k plus one. Therefore, by induction, it's true for all real uh, positive integers. N. Okay, and part two. Prove by induction that for all positive, sorry, prove by induction that for all positive odd integers n, f of n, which equals four to the n plus five to the n plus six to the n, is divisible by 15. Okay, so the first positive odd integer is n is one. So step one, n is one. So we get 4 to the 1 plus 5 to the 1 plus 6 to the 1. That equals 15. Therefore, uh, true for n equals 1. Okay. We can see that is a multiple of 15. Or, or that number is divisible by 15. Okay, step 2. We assume that 4 to the k plus 5 to the k plus 6 to the k is divisible by 15. I'll show that 4 to the k plus 1 plus 5 to the k plus 1 plus 6 to the k plus 1 is also divisible by 15. It's not quite a um, target like the, the series one was. Um, but the same principle that we've got assume our show and but but 4 to the k plus 1 plus 5 to the k plus 1 plus 6 to the k plus 1 is identical to and I want to force out my assumption so I'm going to say that is going to be 4 into 4 to the k plus 5 to the k plus 6 to the k uh, but then I need to add Um, uh, another 5 to the k because I've only got 4 5 to the k's well, so I've got 5 5 to the k's and then I need to add 2 times 6 to the k because again I've got 4 6 to the k's but I want 6 6 to the k's okay, so I get this hmm. can't quite see where this is going yet okay so how is that divisible by 15? Um. Oh, hold on. No, oh, I'm silly. It's every odd integer, isn't it? So I need to do k plus two. Not k plus 1. There we go. So that should be k plus 2. k plus 2. k plus 2. Okay, scratch that. Because ah, it's every odd integer, not every integer. Um, this is unlike most proof by induction questions. Um, so I'm assuming k is odd. Uh, the next odd integer then is k plus 2, not k plus 1. Uh, so I need k plus 2. Okay, these are all 2s. k plus 2. Okay, so it's actually... 
16 into 4 to the k plus 5 to the k plus 6 to the k. But I don't want 16 of the 5s, I want 25. So I need to add 9 times 5 to the k. And I don't want 16, I want 36, 6 to the k's. So I need to add 20 times 6 to the k. There we go. Um, that's identical to 16 times 4 to the k plus 5 to the k plus 6 to the k plus 3 times 5 times 5 to the k minus 1 plus 60 times 6 to the power of k minus 1. And why have I done that? Well, it illustrates that this is a multiple of 15, this is a multiple of 15, and by my assumption, that is a multiple of 15. So I'm summing three multiples of 15 together. So I am summing three multiples of 15. Therefore, this is a multiple of 15. And then finally, step three. Um, I've shown it's true. For n equals one, by assuming it's true for n equals k, I've shown it's true. for n equals k plus 2, different to most proof by inductions. Therefore, it's true for all positive odd integers. And there we go. And I think there's one more question. All right, there's two more questions. Okay, we have matrix M, uh, it's a 3 by 3 matrix. Find the values of K for which the matrix M has an inverse. Okay, I'm going to read ahead to the next part of the question. Uh, find in terms of P, the coordinates of the point where the following planes intersect. Okay, so I'm actually just going to go ahead and find the inverse. Um, there's going to be one value of K for which it doesn't, which you could find by calculating the determinant of this matrix, but I'm actually just going to calculate the inverse of the matrix in terms of K. Uh, that'll be useful for part B anyway. Um, so part A. Um, so element cofactor and debt. I'm going to split that up into three threes. So we've got 2, 3, 3, minus 1, k, 2, 1, 4, minus 1. Right, so the cofactor of the 2 is minus k, minus 8. Um, the cofactor of the 3 is 1, minus 2, so that's minus 1, but it's in a negative position. So minus, uh, positive 1. And then the three here, we're going to have minus four minus k. And the determinant from this section is minus two k minus three k, which is minus five k. Minus sixteen plus three is minus thirteen. Minus twelve is minus twenty-five. And do the same thing for the other two columns. So I've got a minus 1 there. The determinant of the minor is minus 3 minus 12. So it's minus 15, but that's a negative position, so 15. At uh, the k, we've got minus 2 minus 3 is minus 5. And the 2, we've got 8 minus 3, which is 5. But again, that's in a negative position. So that's minus 5. Um, the determinant of this section then is minus 5k. Minus 15 minus 10 is minus 25. That's reassuring that I've got two debts that are the same, which is a good news at this stage. 
And you're not gonna be able to see the matrix now. I'm just gonna roll it off the top of the screen. Um, but I'm doing the same thing as I did on the other two. So I've got six minus three K. Then I've got four plus three, which is seven. That's a negative position, so minus seven. And then I've got two K minus minus three. So that's two K plus three. Okay. And the determinant for this section is minus three K minus two K is minus five K. And then the constant is six minus 28 is minus 22 minus six. That uh, minus three is minus 25. Okay, so I've got the same three determinants um, from each section, which is great. Um, so the answer to part A then is when this is zero. So therefore K um, it doesn't equal minus five. Okay, and that's the answer to part A because it's asked find the values of k for which the matrix M has an inverse. So it's every single value of k, um, real or complex, but real, real for these questions, um, such that k doesn't equal minus 5. Um, because that's the value of k that will make the determinant 0. Um, it seems like a lot of work for two marks. That's because I've set this up nicely to make part B quite easy. So part B, this is all about solving this set of simultaneous equations. So making the link between k and that value there, it's minus six, so k is now minus six. So the answer, x, y, z, is going to be equal to the inverse matrix, where k is minus six. Now, these were the columns of the original matrix, so therefore these are the rows of the inverse. And don't forget to divide by the determinant, which is a fifth in this case. So k is minus six. I've got minus eight plus six is minus two. Then I've got one. Minus four plus six is two. Uh, that's a 15. A minus five. And a minus five. And I've got six plus 18. It's 24. Uh, minus 7 and minus 9. And that is going to be times by the right-hand vector, which is P10. What you can do is you can actually use matrix mode on the calculator just to check uh, that that is um, the correct inverse. Um, so um, the original matrix is 2 minus 1. 1, 3, minus 6, because k is minus 6, 4, 3, 2, minus 1. Okay, so that's now stored in the memory. And now if I withdraw that one, so matrix A, and I want to find the inverse of that, um, which on this calculator, I'm not entirely sure how to do that. Uh, maybe there we go. Uh, so minus two fifths, one fifth, two fifths, uh, 15 fifths, which is three, minus one, minus one, 24 fifths, minus seven fifths, minus nine fifths. Um, okay, so x therefore is going to be minus two p plus one. So it's one minus two p on five. Y is going to be 15 p minus five on five. So that's three p minus one. And Z is going to be 24P minus 7 on 5. Okay. Part C. Find the value of Q for which the set of simultaneous equations below can be solved. Okay, so we can see now that K is minus 5, which kind of further corroborates that this is indeed the correct answer. Um, this doesn't have a unique solution. So it's either got no solutions or infinite solutions. We want it to have infinite solutions because we're asked to find the value of Q such that this system has solutions. So we're going to have to solve this manually. We can see there's no parallel planes because no coefficients on the left are exact multiples of anything else. So there's no par parallel, <laughs> parallel planes here. Um, so they're going to be a sheaf. And that'll be the answer to part two here. Yeah, it's going to form a sheaf. Uh, sorry, it's going to, yeah. Yes, a sheaf in 3D space. 
Um, okay, so let's solve these manually then. So I'm going to call this equation one, equation two, and equation three. And I'm going to eliminate z, um, just because of the plus z already. So I'm going to do equation two, subtract four times equation one. And that'll get rid of my z. So equation two, subtract four times equation one. So I've got 3x minus 8x is minus 5x. Minus 5x, sorry, minus 5y minus 4y is minus 9y. 4z minus 4z is zero, which is what I've done, what I've done. And then I've got q minus four. Okay. And then I'm also just gonna add the top and bottom equations together. And I'll get rid of my z's as well. So that's gonna be five x um, plus y. Hmm, I've done something wrong. Uh, that minus four times that, that minus four times that, ah, yes. Minus five minus minus four is minus one. So that's just minus y. I knew there's something wrong because these two had to be parallel for there to be uh, infinite solutions. Uh, the z's cancel and then one plus zero is one. Okay, so we want these two lines to be the same line for consistency in the two equations. Um, there's a multi multiplier between the top and bottom left hand sides by minus one. So therefore I need to times the top and bottom that by minus one. So I get four minus Q equals one. And that tells me that Q is three. That answers the question. And we can just check that again with the calculator. Always check where you can. It's a system of simultaneous equations. There's three unknowns and the coefficients are two minus one, one, and that equals one. 3 minus 5, 4, I'm going to put in 0, um, 2 minus 1 and 0. That should come up with no solutions, okay, there's no solution to that system of equations. And that's because the value of Q is not the value that I found. Um, the value of Q that I found was the number 3, so let's plug in Q as 3, this should now say infinite solutions. It does, infinitely many solutions. Um, and we can see that actually this calculator has gone through and found uh, this is X and Y in terms of Z, which is great. That's something that the other cashier doesn't do. So fantastic. Um, so yeah, that confirms that Q is three is correct. And uh, for this value of Q, interpret the solution of the set of simultaneous equations geometrically. Well, we've already discussed that they're not parallel. So the only way they're gonna have infinite solutions is if uh, the planes form a sheaf. Okay, so that's... That's one of those. So in 3D space, uh, that's the cross section of the three planes and they all intersect along a, a line that's coming out towards you from the paper. Okay, and final question, question number eight. In this question, you may assume the results for the sum of the first n cubes, n squared and n integers. Show that the sum of the cubes of the first n Positive odd numbers is that thing. Okay. So the positive odd numbers. So for part A, I want 1 cubed plus 3 cubed plus 5 cubed and so on. So the general term is going to be 2R minus 1 cubed. So that's what I'm trying to sum. Um, first, N positive odd numbers. So from that goes going to go from R is 1 to n. Okay. So that's what I'm trying to find. That is going to be equal to the sum from r equals 1 to n of 8r cubed um, minus 12r squared plus 6r minus 1. Okay, so that's uh, using the binomial expansion on that bracket. And now we can apply these, which are in the formula book. So that's going to be 8 times the sum of r cubed, which is n over 4 times n plus 1 squared, minus 12 times the sum of r squared, which is n over 6 times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, 
plus 6r, so that's 6 times n over 2 times n plus 1. And then we have a minus n there. Okay. Um, so there's, there's only n that's common to all of these terms. Uh, so I'm going to pull an n out. What fraction do I need to pull out? Well, I've got a 2 here, I've got a 2 here, I've got a 3 here, and a 1 there. Okay, so no fraction, that's good. And in fact, if I looked at that, I knew that. So I'm going to pull an n out. That's going to leave me with... Oh, that should be squared there. Um, that's going to leave me with 2n times n plus 1 squared from the first term. This one, that's 2 again. Uh, n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. And then this time I've got a plus 3. Uh, the n's come out the front. n plus 1. And then I've got a minus 1. So let's multiply out all of that in there. So that's going to be 2n cubed plus 4n squared plus 2n. That's the first little bit there. Then I've got minus 4n squared. And I'm going to get a 2n plus an n is 3n. So it's minus 6n. And I've got minus 2. I've then got plus 3n plus 3 minus 1. Not back out of the brackets. Uh, collecting the like terms, so I've got 2n cubed. 4n squared minus 4n squared, they obviously disappear. Uh, 2n minus 6n is minus 4n. Oh, plus 3n minus n. And the constants, I've got minus 2 plus 3 minus 1, so that's 0, so that disappears as well. And then I can pull an n out from that. So that's going to leave me with n squared into 2n squared minus 1. Uh, this is exactly what the question wants. And finally, part b. The sum of the cubes of 10 consecutive positive odd numbers is 99,800. Use the answer to part a to determine the smallest of these 10 consecutive positive odd numbers. Okay. The nice thing is, even if you couldn't get that out, you can still use it, which is good. So, the sum of 10 consecutive positive odd numbers. So, I'm going to go from R is something. Let's go from K plus 1 up to K plus 10. Of 2R minus 1 cubed. That is the sum of 10 consecutive... 10 consecutive odd numbers, okay, odd cubes, odd numbers cubed. Um, well, that's going to be equal to the sum from r equals 1 to k plus 10 of 2r minus 1 cubed. Subtract the sum from r equals 1 to k of 2r minus 1 cubed. Okay, so I'm summing the first k plus 10. And then I'm subtracting the first k. And that leaves me with 10. I need to find the value of k. Once I've got the value of k, then I can plug that through and get the first, um, the first of these odd numbers, which is what the question is asking. Right, so now I can use uh, this result that was given in part a um, on these two uh, to extract uh, what this equals. So I'm going to say this sum is equal to k plus 10 squared times 2 into k plus 10 squared minus 1. That's the sum of the first k plus 10 odd numbers cubed. And I'm going to subtract k squared into 2k squared minus 1. And that's the sum of the first k. And we know that this equals 99,800. So I need to find a value of k. It should be some positive integer, although this looks uh, hideous as it currently stands. Hopefully it will tidy up a little bit. Um, so that's k squared plus 20k plus 100 into 2k squared plus 40k 
plus 200 minus 1 plus k squared into 2k squared minus 1. And that's going to give me 2k to the 4, that's a minus, minus 2k to the 4, so they cancel out. Uh, the cubic term, I'm going to get 40 plus 40, uh, no cubic term there. Uh, the quadratic term, I'm going to get 200 plus 199 plus 800. So one more time, the quadratic term is 200 plus 199 plus 800. So 200 plus 199 plus 800. Okay, that gives me the quadratic term from this set, minus quadratic term from this set, which is um, minus one. So minus one is one is plus one. Uh, so like it comes out to be 1200 um, K squared. At the K term, we're going to get 199 times 20. And we're also going to get 100 times 40. Uh, so that's 7980 K. And the constant term is 100 times 199, which is 19,900. Okay, so that's my polynomial, which is quartic, um, but the quartic term disappears, so actually it's cubic. So we're going to get 80k cubed plus 1200k squared plus 7980k plus 19,900, and we want that to equal 99,800. So that is a cubic equation in K, which Zambo would know full well that you can take this calculator in and the FX991, which will solve this as well. It's a polynomial of degree three. Um, so I'm just punching the coefficients and it'll give me the answer. So 80, 1200, 7980, 19,900, and then I've got a minus this across to the other side. So that's minus 99,800. And I'm looking for a nice integer value, which I did not get. Okay, so I've done something wrong somewhere. Okay. So. K squared plus 20K plus 100. 2K squared. 10 times K twice is 20K times 2 is 40K. Then I've got the 100, the 200 minus 1. And I've not done anything with that. And then here, I've got 2k to the 4 minus 2k to the 4. k cubed, I've got 1 times 40 plus 20 times 2. That's 80k cubed. The quadratic term, I've got 200 plus 20 times 40. Uh, plus 199 and I've also got plus 1k squared from here so that's 1200k squared the, the linear term I've got 100 times 40 plus 199 times 20 which is 7980 yeah. and the constant term I've got 100 times 199 and there's no constant there so it's 19,900, and that equals 99,800. Hmm. Okay, maybe I punched it into the equation solver wrong. Polynomial degree 3, 80, 1200, 7,980. Oh, yeah, I did. It's 19,900 subtract 99,800. There we go. I didn't combine those two. Right. Um, there we go. I get that uh, K is 5. 
I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pop here from calculator so the examiner knows where I've got that number from. Completely louder than the exam. Um, so I've got k is five, so that tells me that the first odd number, which is down here, it was when k is five. So plugging plug in r is six into there, and I'll get two times six minus one is eleven. So the first odd number. is 11 and that is um, k equals 5 implies r1 equals uh, 6 um, which then in turn implies that 2 r1 minus 1 equals 11 so that's where that's come from and we can check the answer of course um, 11 cubed plus 13 cubed plus 15 cubed plus 17 cubed, plus 19 cubed, plus 21 cubed, plus 23 cubed, plus 25 cubed, plus 27 cubed, plus 29 cubed. I think that's 10, isn't it? 11, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19, 21, 23, 25, 27, 29. It is 99,800. There we go. So that confirms that that is indeed the correct answer. Um, Okay, so I went through that paper with you no know, marks myself, so I do hope everything is correct. Um, I did check all of the answers as I went through, so I'm fairly confident that these are uh, all the correct answers, but if I made a mistake or you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to drop a comment uh, in the video, or if I'm your teacher, just come and ask me. Uh, thanks for watching.